All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Live Lab. Um, <clears throat> I'm Dan Bosniak. I'm the technical director here. Uh, usually, I would be here to uh, greet many of you in person, but of course, tonight uh, we're doing this virtually, which is, I suppose, almost as good. Um, we've got, well, 100 people so far. Hopefully, a few more will show up before we actually get started. Uh, we've got the people coming from the 16th annual Neuro Music Conference. 16th is, if you can imagine that, we've been doing it for so long. Uh, we've got, I'm sure, some of our Live Lab concert series supporters that we usually get to our Live Lab concert series. And of course, now we have uh, some alumni, hopefully from all over the world, because we've got some support from the <laughs> alumni department and they've sent out the link to this concert. To, for free to uh, for, to McMaster alumni, so um, that's great. Hopefully, there's some uh, alumni here. Uh, while we're on that topic, I will uh, acknowledge our sponsors for this evening. Uh, we've got uh, we've got uh, uh, the alumni association, as I said. We've got TD Insurance. Uh, we're very grateful to them for helping us out this year. Uh, we have the Insight Foundation, who's sponsored this concert series for a number of years. Uh, we're, we're grateful to them. Um, <clears throat> and also uh, Unitron uh, Hearing Aids uh, has sponsored one of our concerts this year. Judy Marsales, uh, as usual, comes through for us uh, from Marsales Real Estate. And Long and McQuaid, as well, are a sponsor. Uh, so thanks all very much to all of them. Uh, while I'm on that topic, I just want to point out that if you look just just below me, uh, there's a donate button uh, there. And uh, you know this this year, of course, uh, we don't have any ticket sales uh, to help support these concerts. Uh, if you uh, if you feel like you can spare a few dollars uh, or uh, whatever is appropriate you think is appropriate, uh, the donate button is there. Please uh, feel free to use it uh, if you appreciate us. Uh, we're, we're trying to support the artists in this uh, very difficult time, as well as support the Live Lab, uh, which I think is a very worthy cause. Uh, there's also a merchandise button there. So if you're a Lila Bayali supporter, you can get some Lila Bayali merchandise uh, from this concert. And every, every concert that comes up will have an appropriate merchandise button. Uh, finally, I just want to mention the third button uh, over on the right, I think it is. Uh, which is a survey that, that we would uh, be very grateful if you guys would complete at the end, which give us some feedback, uh, what you think uh, about the concert series this year and, and ways that we might be able to improve it and just general questions like that. <clears throat> All right. Um, well, this concert is, we're streaming this concert uh, uh, in real time on uh, YouTube, on a YouTube live channel. Uh, we had envisioned, I think, that... Uh, you know, our concert series was going to be uh, different than everyone else's uh, uh, during this this uh, COVID time. Uh, we were going to have actual live performances, uh, but if, because that's you know what the live lab is all about is is live music, live performance. Uh, it turned out that uh, you know some safety issues and some technical issues prevented us from uh, doing that for tonight's concert. <clears throat> we make the we hope gradually to sort of make the transition if, if, if necessary, if we have to keep doing these things as live streams, which I think we'll always do live streams from now on. But uh, um, uh, anyway, as we go through this, this season's concert series, we hope to gradually make things more interactive. If the situation changes, we'll, ha we'll have actual live performers and, and live film crew so that, uh, so that it's uh, a little bit more like the old days, the good old days. Um, but uh, we're starting out slow tonight. So me live here tonight, uh, concerts pre-recorded, however. Um, so as I said, it's on YouTube. Now, if you want to watch it on YouTube instead of uh, in the browser, uh, well, there's, there's three ways you can watch the concert. You can watch it in this little window on the browser, which is probably not the best way. Uh, you could maximize it using the maximize button. So it'll take up your full window there in your browser. I think that's on the lower right. It's a little square symbol. Uh, or you can uh, hit the YouTube button that will pop up if you mouse over the window. It'll say YouTube on it. If you click it, it'll open a new tab in your browser, and you can watch the the show on YouTube itself in, in real time. 
Uh, the advantage of watching it on YouTube is, um, well, first of all, you can like the video and you can uh, subscribe to our channel, which would be really helpful uh, if we get enough subscribers to our uh, YouTube channel, then there's certain features that we can access in the future uh, that we wouldn't be able to access right now. Um, so go on to, I encourage everyone to uh, go on to YouTube itself and, and watch the concert from there. And of course, subscribe and like. Uh, but uh, the other important feature, of course, is if you go on to uh, the uh, YouTube chan channel to watch it, uh, there's, there's going to be a live chat um, uh, that you can see and uh, uh, participate in uh, below the concert. So you could watch it in maybe in theater mode. Uh, there's different buttons uh, that you can set up the screen different ways. And, uh, <clears throat> um, and you'll be able to access... Uh, access to chat. I see there's already some questions there. Oh, Lila's here. Oh, that's good. So if you go to the chat, you can ask Lila some questions. Um, yeah. Um, so go ahead and switch over right now if you like. Um, I just want to, um, while well, I'm on the, well, while well, you guys are switching over, I'm going to mention uh, the concert that we're having uh, in two weeks, I think it is, on November the 28th, which will be Adi Braun. So uh, be here for that. Uh, the same procedure to sign up for that. Just go to the Live Lab uh, webpage and you'll find the appropriate links to, uh, to get on uh, uh, and get an invite to that concert. <clears throat> All right. So let me have a quick look at what I'm doing here. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is my first time doing a, a, a live stream. So if anything goes wrong, please uh, feel free to blame me for that. Um, it's all, it will all be my fault. Uh, yeah. Um, so how it's going to go tonight is obviously I'm going to play the concert. Uh, we can all watch. Uh, we can all make our comments in the live chat, uh, experience this thing together. And <clears throat> if there's any comments in there that we can address, uh, the, the, there'll be uh, people from our lab and from the live lab staff uh, on hand to, to comment. Um, and uh, once the concert's done, I'll come back to this live stream. We can uh, have a little uh, commentary, maybe some see what's going on in the chat, respond to any questions that happen to be there, uh, and, uh, and then wrap things up. All right, so uh, for those of you who remember, maybe put something in the chat if you remember this, but uh, about, Six years or so ago, uh, we had this grand opening at the Live Lab. It was uh, totally sold out. There was people lined up around the block to get in for a Live Lab tour in the afternoon. And then in the evening, we had our, our headline act, which was the Lila Bialy Trio. Uh, Lila Bialy on piano, Lauren L. Lewis on drums, George Kohler on bass. Uh, who, who all was there? I don't know. Uh, just feel free to pipe up if you were. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure some of you were there. Tonight, as it turns out, we have exactly the same lineup back again. Uh, there are, however, some, some differences with tonight's show. Um, you'll notice, uh, for example, all the musicians are each in their own little plexiglass bubble uh, for safety purposes. Uh, it, this, of course, uh, made things a little bit more difficult, both, both from the perspective of the musicians who are used to sort of being able to interact with each other a little more closely. Everyone was spaced out. Everyone had to be 12 feet apart and uh, uh, surrounded by plexiglass. So it was a little different, uh, I think, from their perspective. Of course, these guys are, uh, are consummate professionals, so they're easily able to adapt to that. Uh, the, the video crew, I think, did a great job, as you'll see, uh, adapting to the fact that the plexiglass was there. Uh, I can assure you that no musicians or audience members were harmed during the production of tonight's concert. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I'm gonna. I think I'm just gonna get started with the concert and let the music uh, speak for itself. So, for tonight, it's the uh, the first concert of the uh, 2020 2021 season from the Live Lab, uh, the Lila Bialy Trio. Hi, I'm Lila Bialy, and uh, that's Larnell Lewis on drums, George Kohler on the bass. 
We've got a lot to say uh, today, but we're going to dive right into the music and let uh, the music speak for itself initially. This is a song I wrote inspired by a season living in New York City, and it's called Got to Love. <laughs> Brooklyn for thrilled to be here as part of the uh, Neuro Music Conference with a focus of um, cross-cultural perspectives. And uh, I was really excited when Laurel Trainer invited us to be a part of this conference. Initially, I thought it was just a regular performance, um, you know, something to entertain conference participants and other people watching. And then I learned that she wanted to go a little bit deeper and that she chose jazz musicians because um, cross-cultural influences are so inherent to this music we call jazz. Um, and I, I had to sort of revisit the history of the music because, you know, I, I can remember what I was taught 20 years ago in college and, and um, just conversations I've had along the way with other musicians who have a great love of this music. But I wanted to take a deep dive into the foundations of jazz. And I won't get too much into the nitty gritty of it, and some of you may already be aware of you know, where this music has largely come from. But I do wanna mention and highlight what many think of as the birthplace of jazz, which is New Orleans, because New Orleans in and of itself as this port city was this incredible melting pot of, of people from cultures from the world over. You know, it started off as a French colony, and, and then uh, I, I heard this story of how they actually brought down a, a bunch of Acadian folks from Canada, and then there was the Louisiana Purchase, the U.S. piece, and, um, 
and then the Haitian traders who came up. And so you have this, this incredible mix of cultures and people mixing with one another and it manifested in the music and in this music we now call jazz. And obviously there's, there's much more to uh, the history and formation of jazz, but what I wanna say as a contemporary jazz musician is that it's a music that, a type of music, a genre that can't and won't stand still. It continues to evolve and change and expand and there, there are all sorts of subgenres within ja jazz and so many of those subgenres, whether it's fusion jazz, Latin jazz, Brazilian jazz, and you can hear it in the names themselves, um, have been informed by cultural input from different places in the world. And I'm excited to introduce you to these players because their formative experience as musicians um, is totally divergent, and yet here we are making music together and bringing our own respective experience to the music, and that makes what happens in this moment today um, something I think is very special, and it would be totally different if it was another bassist or another drummer playing the very same music, very same songs. Um, so quickly, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, again, I'm Lila Bialy. I grew up a classically trained pianist. My mom is German, my dad is Egyptian, however, um, my mom was the one who would play CBC Radio 2, which is now CBC Music, when I was growing up, that was what she had piping in the background of our kitchen and kind of, you know, wafting through the house every day, day in and day out. And that, at the time, was exclusively a classical music station. And I was trained as a classical pianist. And so, um, you know, I had this very specific experience and upbringing as a musician. Um, and, and then when I was introduced to jazz, it kind of blew my mind. And it had such a different feeling to it. And I remember as a classically trained uh, concert pianist, well, concert pianist, pianist playing concert repertoire, it was so hard. It was almost painful to let go of, you know, certain ideas about how I would make music at the piano. I wanted the music to be written out. I was asked to improvise, and improvisation is such a big part of jazz. And I would just you know, implode sometimes at the prospect of having to come up with something because I was so accustomed to having it on a, written on a page in front of me. And it was also a very different harmonic approach. And in that sense, it kind of forced me out of my classical box. But now, now that I am a, a fully fledged jazz musician, um, I look back on that classical upbringing and I actually borrow from the songs and th that, that I learned and the sounds that I absorbed. And I now incorporate those into the way that I approach jazz, and I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a minute with a song called um, Autumn Leaves. But I do wanna quickly hand over, we were calling it the conch, uh, inside joke, hand over the mic to Larnell and George just briefly so they can give you um, an overview of, of their musical upbringing as well. So that's Larnell on drums, Larnell Lewis. How's it going? Yeah, glad to be here. Um, Larnell Lewis playing drums. And my upbringing started in church. And actually, before it started in church, uh, through my family, music has been around since, uh, as far as back as I know, my great-grandfather from Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. And of course, then to my gra grandfather, multi-instrumentalist in St. Kitts in the Caribbean. Um, all my uncles and my dad played instruments, and my mom's family as well, they're musicians. And of course, that gets to me and my family, and now extended to my wife and our kids. Yeah. And so music being a tradition in our family where it's more of that communal sense. Uh, Christmas time is always awesome, or usually is always <laughs> awesome, because we'd get together, and uh, we're all playing different instruments and switching, and then you know people are dancing, and there's food, and it's just like a party. Mm -hmm. You know, you could imagine me bringing my wife now, who was my girlfriend then, to the first hang, <laughs> but she brought her steel pan out and was obviously you know, cool enough to hang with everybody. But, uh, you know, bringing that into the church, uh, not your standard experience around the world, but it's still awesome because having that Caribbean influence along with the hymns and other types of music and integrating those together um, was my upbringing. That was my school before I went to an arts high school and before I went to college for music, right? So at a young age, my dad being the musical director at the church, he definitely did his best to in, you know, include as much music from the Caribbean 
and you know he'd say you know you got to give me that James Brown funk you got to <laughs> give me this you got to give me that and so I was hearing a lot of this at the age of like you know seven eight nine needing to perform at a high level with people who are three and four times my age mm -hmm. and so um, it was a great experience school of hard knocks and of course um, my introduction to jazz was in high school like more of a formal approach um, and I didn't like it <laughs> I didn't like it at all um, but I think I needed to have my own experience with it instead of just kind of reading through these charts that we had in high school. And um, I was blessed to be at Mayfield Secondary School to connect with a lot of different teachers there who gave me an opportunity to explore the music and understand how to hear my voice through this expression, which you know is the idiom of jazz. And so, yeah, that's a little bit about me. That's so wonderful. And, um, you know, I want to just say, in case folks are like, wow, they're really talking a lot, this is probably the longest we'll talk throughout our segment, um, just as an introduction to who we are and why we do what we do. But I want to just pick up on something you said there about jazz initially being something you didn't like. And I had the same experience, and it's because in a lot of institutional settings, especially for younger players learning jazz in high school or what have you, what you do is very prescribed. And, and, and the spirit of jazz is the opposite of that. And this is a brilliant segue to George. Because, you know, if I've ever known anybody who is kind of unconfined um, and just <laughs> marches to the beat of his own drummer, so to speak, it's George. And in working with George, I um, have learned to kind of shed some of my fears around what it means to be a jazz musician and how to be expected in this sort of within this narrow view of jazz when in fact it is such an expansive genre, which is why I love how you approach it and also George. So welcome George Kohler on bass. Love to hear a little bit about your background. Sure, thanks Lila. I'll, I'll try to summarize. Uh, it's been pretty expansive and I've always loved music, all kinds of music. And um, it started with classical piano onto bass, which I loved the sound of at age 13 and then into classical forms, including orchestra and stuff like that, which I love, symphonic music. Simultaneously, actually doing church music as well, uh, at the, um, playing in a folk group in church, and then um, in a rock band, and then the dawn of rock jazz, oh, yeah. uh, with blood, sweat, and tears. That it kind of turned me on to jazz. I thought, this is great. And of course, jamming with my friends, always creating, I could have taken the, I went to university, I could have taken the path of classical, but I realized that I'm a free spirit and jazz was the place that I recognized that individuals can develop their unique personality simultaneously while listening to five or six others doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was such a great art form for that reason alone, the free speech organized individuality is, is, is encouraged and celebrated. Mm -hmm. And it was almost as if, uh, in, a, in the world of jazz, it was almost as if, if you weren't being unique, if you weren't being yourself, you weren't doing it right. Mm -hmm. If you were trying to copy the greats, that was almost, okay, that's okay for training, but not your ultimate goal. Your goal was to find your true voice mm -hmm. yourself. So, um, of course, in that time, I became very interested in music of the world, the dawn of ECM records. I loved Indian music. I studied it extensively. Uh, it got so deep into it. Like, when you get into these worlds of music, sometimes you can fall into them so deeply that you almost uh, fall too deep. And I did for a while. But I was able to pull myself back and incorporate what I've learned with, with the music that I'm working on and, and loving. I was fortunate enough to be, grow up in a city, uh, Edmonton, the size, uh, you know, medium-sized Canadian city, where they had a great jazz society, and I was able to be a rhythm section player for many of the great American artists that came through, including Sonny Stitt, Dizzy Gillespie, um, the list goes on and on. I, I had a chance to play with all of them, and um, I studied with a great blues singer, Big Miller from Kansas City, who taught all of Alberta what the blues were all about. So, um, yeah, and now Toronto, uh, I'm, you know, been in the business for 45 years, traveled the world, 
and um, you never stop learning about music. It's, it's never ending, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, so we are gonna make some more music, how about that? <laughs> And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a couple songs back to back. We're gonna do um, a song that made its way into what we call the Great American Songbook, Autumn Leaves, Les Feuilles Mortes. Um, and it's not a traditional American Songbook tune in that a lot of what constitutes the, Ameri the Great American Songbook is um, from like Broadway musicals from the 30s up through the 50s and uh, beyond. Um, but really the 30s, 40s, and 50s primarily. And, um, and uh, so anyway, this song made its way into the current iteration of what we call the Great American, Song American Songbook. But again, I bring my classical background to how I approach it. We'll do a really short version of it. It's called Autumn Leaves because we had such gorgeous colors this year. And then we'll go into what I call the Canadian Songbook. And there is a trend in modern jazz where artists are taking songs by incredible Canadian singer-songwriters like Joni Mitchell, Leonard Cohen, Feist, Sarah McLaughlin, Neil Young, the list goes on, and arranging them for um, jazz players, a jazz ensemble, and giving them a little bit of a jazz sensibility, which I've tried to do here, and uh, for that I chose Woodstock. And you'll hear a little bit of the Afro-Cuban flavor from the drums on that one, so keep an ear out for that. Um, so Autumn Leaves followed by Woodstock. Thank you. I have 
Larnell Lewis on the drums. <laughs> We're going to play one song now that I wrote, an original composition um, called Satellite. And it's about being away from loved ones. And I understand that uh, one of the speakers uh, this weekend um, talks about four sociological categories into which music can be slotted quite neatly across 60 different uh, cultures that he examined, or he or she. And uh, so anyway, this one fits into the love category and it's called Satellite. Oh. 
right, now we've got a treat for you because um, as George Kohler described earlier, you know, he has been really influenced by Eastern music um, and Eastern philosophy, I think, in general. Um, and uh, this is a song that was written by a mystic. Um, his name was Eden Abbas. He had a different birth name. I thought he was of Turkish descent. He is, he is not of Turkish descent. He is a Brooklyn boy. He's a Jewish boy from Brooklyn. And he wrote this song. Um, and you know, he, he was an unknown songwriter. Um, and then he managed to get it into the hands of Nat King Cole, one of the great jazz artists of our time, well, of all time. And, uh, and that was how this song um, was ultimately uh, added to the great American songbook. It's what we call a jazz standard, um, as opposed to a Broadway song that, that uh, became a jazz standard. So anyway, this is, this is a great moment where we get to highlight the, the wonderful Eastern influences that George has absorbed as a player because I, I heard this lyric. I, I sang this song when it was Nature Boy, you know, like a jazz standard. I wish I could, I don't even think I can remember the original way that it goes. But uh, it definitely sounds more straightforward than how we are about to perform it for you. But I caught on to what to me, before I even knew Eden Abbas's background, the composer's background, I just felt that it was a mystical song. There's the, the final lyric, you know, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. It's, there's a spiritual quality to the line and, and, uh, and as you're about to hear in a moment, a real spiritual quality to the song. So we decided that we would totally scrap the original, you know, um, great American songbook version, as it were, and, and go about it our own way, taking advantage of, of uh, who George is as a player. And actually, we performed this once with him at the sitar, because he plays the sitar. But he's going to approximate that Eastern sound and Eastern feeling now from his upright bass. So here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
George Kohler on bass. <laughs> All right, we're going to take you to New York City now, one of the hotbeds of jazz. Um, there was uh, a huge migration um, that happened uh, between 1910 and 1930, where musicians from the South, about 1.6 million people, moved north um, to cities where there were more opportunities, Chicago and New York City in particular. And that was when jazz really began to morph and change, and New York became one of the primary places that uh, jazz would become known for. And uh, this is my tribute to New York City. I lived there for eight and a half years, just short of becoming an official New Yorker. Apparently, New Yorker magazine says it takes nine years, <laughs> which is such a bizarre uh, number, uh, such an arbitrary number. But anyway, I was there eight and a half years. And uh, it truly is the city that never sleeps. And uh, it's very different in these times, but it is a spirit that, in my opinion, is indefatigable and will always find its way forward. And that creative spirit ultimately, um, I think, will triumph in the end. So this is called We Go. It's got a little bit of a soul jazz, Latin jazz flavor. So you can look for that in this one. Yeah? Wake them up again. <laughs> Two, one, two, three, four. <laughs>
Larnell on the drums, George Kohler on the bass. We are uh, the Lila Bialy Trio. I always feel bizarre saying Lila Bialy Trio because really we are all co-pilots up here on this stage. And I'm so grateful to be able to make music in these times. And we're gonna continue now. Let me take a peek at my notes here. All right, we're gonna continue with a uh, song that is also part of a newer tradition in jazz, which is that um, musicians now more than ever are taking songs from uh, what is currently the mainstream music of the day. And uh, jazz, of course, at some point was the popular music of its day, but now, you know, it's something other. And so musicians are having great fun taking hits, whether it's, you know, Justin Bieber, baby, baby, <laughs> or, or Rolling in the Deep uh, by Adele, or, you know, name that tune. I think people have even done like, oh yeah, just na you name a hit song and there's some jazz musician out there who's had a great deal of fun turning that song on its head. And uh, so I haven't done that entirely in this instance, but I started something I call the Request-O-Matic, where I would invite people to request any song they wanted to hear, no restrictions on genre, and a lot of folks wanted to hear pop songs. And this was one of the very first requests that came in, and it was out in Vancouver. I was doing a Request-O-Matic tour, and it's a song by Coldplay that I happen to know and love. A lot of the requests that come in, I have no, I've never even heard the song. Um, but this one I knew, and I decided that I would bring a little bit of that classical sensibility to it, um, and a little bit of the raindrop prelude. It, this is called Yellow, and we're gonna feature Larnell on this.
right, that was Larnell Lewis on drums. And we're going to feature Larnell a little bit more and, and actually invite him to say a few more words just about um, how he brings his uh, unique cultural background to jazz. And this next song is a, is a great opportunity for him to do that because it was um, written with kind of an African sound in mind by me. Um, but first, I want to say uh, thank you so much to Live Lab and the Institute for Music in the Mind here at McMaster University for inviting us to be a part of this conference. It's such a privilege um, to be a part of, you know, what I see as kind of the cutting edge of the intersection of music and science. And um, special thanks to Laurel Trainer and also to Susan and Sally, my old friends, who helped get us situated, um, and Dan, who's been helping on sound as well, and Ronald, who kind of, you know, brings brings the sound to the stage and. Uh, and does such a great job. It's a treat to see him again. Um, and then also to this wonderful crew we have here with us today. Um, I hope I haven't missed anybody. I'm sure I have. But uh, thank you very much for, for watching and participating. And um, for this last song, uh, it was one that I wrote in the middle of the night. I woke up and I just had this simple melody. I could hear this doop, doop. Sort of African-inspired beat in the background, and uh, and then I brought it to Larnell as I do, and let him do his thing with it. And of course, you know, this is a great moment to say that such a big part of what makes jazz jazz is is that you know the tradition, that African, um, the Afri African rhythms, and um, and in, on this song, it's it is a little bit more of a world jazz song, anyway. Um, but Larnell will bring that to it, and as well as a little bit of the Caribbean flavor that you bring to music um, at different points in time. So if you want to just talk a little bit about that, maybe give us a couple of examples before we play the song. Yeah, I might <laughs> actually roll my example right into the intro. Oh, sounds yeah. great. So, so why don't we just have you take it away then? Yeah, so I'll explain yeah. a little bit. Um, so being of Caribbean descent, um, that's my connection, you know, uh, as far as like to Africa. And mm -hmm. what I think is a great segue is to kind of make this full circle and bring it back to New Orleans. And that rhythm that you're talking about is actually the bambula, oh, right? And didn't so, even know. yeah, <laughs> so one, two, three, four, bambula, bambula, bambula. And you, you find that, here too. yeah, you find a lot of that in New Orleans music, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> And so coming out of New Orleans and that tradition, right, bringing it as far as a jazz perspective to what's happening, you know, there's, especially with Africa, there's a lot of that conversational, you know, call and response stuff. So you might hear a rhythm on one drum. Woo! Right? So that's the thing that I've experienced in the Caribbean, I've experienced with my family, I've experienced in jazz music, and it's definitely something that exists throughout a lot of different styles that are connected to Africa. And so I think it's a beautiful way to end this performance, you know. Um, I believe Bambula is also an interpretation of together or family. And so I want to say I'm thankful for this opportunity to be together with all of you and to make this happen. So let's get this going. Bambula. <laughs>
Cornell Lewis on drums, George Kohler on bass, I'm Lila Vialli. Thanks again. Have a great weekend. All right. So that was Larnell Lewis at the end there on drums. Amazing. Uh, George Kohler on bass, Lila Bayali on piano, of course. Uh, what did you guys think? I think that was not bad for a first effort. Um, everyone stuck around to the end, so it must have been good, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll find your way to support the Live Lab if you can. Um, don't forget, uh, let me fade this in here. Don't forget, uh, in two weeks, we've got another one coming up, Addy Braun. So it's another jazz performance. Uh, it's going to be a good one. <clears throat> so tune in for that one if you can. Uh, yeah, it was a great concert. I, I hope you guys appreciated it. Uh, you know, despite the everyone being in their own plexiglass tank, I think they did a good job. Uh, yeah. Thanks to Lila for being here for the chat tonight. That was great. Thanks to everyone else who commented. Uh, I think we're going to uh, tune out now. I got some kind of a closing screen here. No, wait. Here it goes. Thanks for watching, everyone. <laughs>